You may not realize that proportions appear sometimes as ratios. Red to yellow is 3 to 2. Or equations on a conversion problem. 10 lorgs equals 3 dalts. Or maybe it's fractions in a probability problem. The probability of an event is 2 fifths. Or an age word problem. John's age is one third of Zach's. Today, I want to develop a framework to solve the most basic proportion problem. Start with the simplest case. How do we set it up? How do we proceed toward the solution? And then once we've mastered that, we'll extend it to more complex cases. Because ultimately, all these presentations are the same concept at play. So by learning one concept and method, we can potentially solve a whole host of different problems on the exam. Let's start with the fundamental case, the single proportion problem. Essentially, this problem starts with a fixed ratio or proportion of things. Blue to red is in a ratio of 3 to 2, for example. In addition, you're usually given the actual amount of one of the items. For example, there are 27 blue items here. Or perhaps you're given a total. The objective of these problems is to use the ratio, the fixed ratio, and the amounts given to find the missing amounts of the other elements, or again, possibly the total. So how do we do that? We need to form a proportion equation from the given information in the problem. For example, a proportion equation structure is A divided by B equals C divided by D. This is our typical proportion equation. When given ratios, the way we can do that is by essentially taking the second ratio and swinging it underneath to make it the left side of our proportion equation. So B to R becomes B over R, the number of B over the number of R, and that equals our fixed proportion. Again, swing the second part of the proportion under the first as the fraction, 3 divided by 2. So the number of B divided by the number of R equals 3 divided by 2. At this point, I know how many Bs I have. The amount of Bs given in the problem was 27. I'm going to substitute that amount in for the number of Bs over here. Now I have a proportion equation with one variable that I can solve for, R, and it answers the question on the simple case, how many R would there be given the fixed proportion if there are 27 Bs? And the answer is R equals 27 divided by 3 is 9 times 2. R is 18. If we were told the total amount of blue and red is 45, for example, we would proceed essentially the same way to start. We'd set up our proportion equation. Blue divided by red equals 3 divided by 2. In this case, I'm going to solve for one of the variables in terms of the other. So for example, B equals, after R divided by R is just one, canceling, B equals three halves R. Okay, well, it's not a numerical answer like before in the last case, but now I can use this with my second equation for the total amounts. B plus R equals 45. I know what B is in terms of R. I'm going to take that and substitute the other way for B in my total equation. B is really 3 halves R. Plus R is just, well, R equals 45. Now I have one equation, one variable I can solve. And that becomes 1R, or R, equals 2 fifths times 45. Well, 45 divided by 5, I know, is 9. So that's 9 times 2. R equals 18. And that answers the question. How many R are there if the ratio of B to R is 3 to 2 and the total amount is 45? Let's look at another presentation format. In this case, my fixed proportion is given to me as an equation. 
like 3B equals 2R. And they'll obviously stand for something. Maybe that's three British pounds equal two US dollars. And then I'm given an amount again. I have 115 Bs, maybe British pounds, if that's what the problem indicates. How many US dollars or how many Rs can I convert that into? So again, we want to set up a proportion equation. How do we do that in this case? In this case, we would take the elements of what they are, the B and the R, and we'd again pull the second part under the first. So that would be B divided by R equals, and the numerical values of the coefficients of those variables, we'll pull the one on the right down under the three. So that would be three divided by two. This would be the equivalent proportion equation for the three B equals two R equation. B, the number of B divided by the number of R equals three divided by two. If you wanted to put that in an intermediate ratio format, we could. We would just simply say that's B to R, the left to the right, is three to two. And then we do the same thing as we did before. We pull the R under the B, the two under the three, and we get this proportion equation. Same concept, just a different delivery presentation. Let's look at another case where the information is presented as a fraction. Now that could be part to a whole, say in a probability problem, or it could be a part to a part, say John's age to Zach's age, part one to part two, is one to three. So if we know J, John's age is 15, we could substitute that into our proportion equation. We're already a step ahead of the game of the previous presentations because we essentially have our proportion equation set up as fractions already. So I would substitute 15 for J, 15 over Z equals one over three. The result is Z equals three times 15 or 45. So Zach's age is 45 in that case. It's almost a little bit easier. The part to whole case, let's suppose we do have a probability problem. Perhaps the probability of an event is one third, okay? So in this case, three represents the total, not the partial amount. In this case, we're given an amount. Say there are uh, 90 samples taken. You know, I'd set up my equation. Part to whole equals one to three. That represents, out of a total of 90, how many would meet whatever condition be the part. Maybe it's the number of blue marbles picked out of a bag, etc. And we already have our proportion equation set up for us. And n would equal 90 divided by 3, in this case, which equals 30. At this point, we've touched upon many of the different presentation formats for our single proportion case. Basically the fundamental or basic scenario we'll run into. And we've seen the different presentations as ratios or equations or fractions, which we then convert into a proportion equation. In this lesson, we're gonna look at double proportion problems. So when I see these problems, I think of that Guns N' Roses song, Welcome to the Jungle. Welcome to the jungle, da 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 da, -da. Welcome to the jungle, to the jungle, to the jungle, da 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 da. All right, yeah, my karaoke is terrible. I admit it. But unlike that, the double proportion problems really aren't that bad. It's just single proportions that we went through in the lessons leading up to this applied twice with some extra calculations along the way to make it work out. Let's take a look. Suppose I had two different proportions. A to B is three to two. B to C is five to four. Well, each of those I can set up as separate proportion equations. A to B is three to two. That's A divided by B equals three divided by two as the proportion equation. And secondly, the B to C is five to four. Well, that's B divided by C equals five divided by four. Okay, well, how do I work with that? Well, let's solve for one of the variables. We aren't going to get a numerical value, and we've seen that case already in the single case, in the single proportion problem. I'm gonna multiply by B on both sides, 
and I'm going to solve for C in terms of B. I'm going to try and keep the variable I solve in terms of the same. That'll make life easier as we move forward. So divide by the coefficient of C on both sides. And we'll see C, fives cancel, equals 4B divided by 5, or 4 fifths B. And like every proportion problem up to this point, not only do they give you fixed ratios, but they give you the amounts of one of the elements, A, B, or C, or in this case, the total amount, which is often how these problems are presented. So suppose the total amount given in this case were 99. What do we know? We know A plus B plus C, the sum of all the parts, equals the total 99. And what do I do with that? Well. A, I solved in terms of B. C, I solved for in terms of B. I'm going to substitute those values back in. So A is really 3 halves and B, well, that's just B. And C is 4 fifths B, so I'm going to substitute that up in for C, 4 fifths B. Now I can find a common denominator and combine like terms. Between B will equal on the right side, 99 times 10 divided by 33. And I know 99 divided by 33 is just 3. So B equals 3 times 10 or 30. So if the question asks specifically how many Bs are there, we know it's 30. And what if the question asks for the number of A's and C's? Well, we would take that 30 for B and substitute it back into either one of our original equations. And A equals 3 halves B, that's 3 halves times 30, or 45 for A. C equals 4B over 5, so that's 4 times 30 divided by 5, which is 24. Add those up, 45 plus 24 plus 30, that's A plus B plus C, you do get 99. So we can check our answers at the end as well. Let's see that same double proportion problem presented in equation format. 1.25a equals 2b, 3b equals 5c, and we're given an amount. The original amount of a's are 500. We want to know how many c's is equivalent to that 500 a's. Maybe it's an exchange problem where you convert 500 a's into c's. How many will we get? Well, the approach is going to be the same. Let's take our equations and set up equivalent proportion equations. So how do we do that? We know 1.25a equals 2b, the a divided by the b equals the 1.25, pulling the 2 under, divided by 2. That's our proportion equation for the number of a to the number divided by the number of b. Likewise, on the second equation, 3b equals 5c, I would say b, pulling the c underneath, b divided by c equals 3 divided by 5. And that's our second proportion equation. At this point, we could solve the system equations, but I like to start with the units we have, adjust given the conversion or proportions to get to the units we need in the end. So I start with a units. I ultimately want my units to be in C. So how do I do that? I've got 500A, I need to convert the A to C. Well, I don't have an A to C conversion directly, but I do have A to B. I could multiply this effectively by B over A, which we know is the reciprocal of 5 8. So it's 8B for every 5A. And I'm gonna multiply my 500A times that. The A units cancel. My resulting answer of what would be 800 at this point is in terms of Bs. Now I'm going to convert Bs to Cs because I have that connection from B to C right here. So I have B on top, so I need to get rid of Bs. I'm going to take the reciprocal. I'm going to take 5 Cs divided by 3 Bs. The Bs will cancel top to bottom, and I will end up in units that are now just Cs, which is exactly what I want. It's 800 times 5, which is 4,000 divided by 3. 4,000 divided by 3C. So if I had 500As and I convert it into Cs, 
I'll end up with basically 1,333 and a third Cs. What if my initial setup is in ratios for my double proportion equation? I've got A to B is given to me as 5 to 7, and then B to C is given me as 7 to 9. The nice thing in that case, the B units are the same for both ratios given to me. It's 7. That way I know 5 to 9 is a direct proportion. And suppose the problem gave me a total of 210 items. And I want to know how many C's were in that. So I know the proportions. I could scale them 5x plus 7x, where x is just my scale factor. Well, sum to 210. I have to have these proportions multiplied by scale factor to get my total. Well, what does that work out to? 9x and 7x is 16x plus 5x is 21x equals 210. x equals 10. That's my scale factor. Not my answer, my scale factor. Remember, the amounts, the amounts of any given element, C in this case, is the scale factor times the proportion. So the amount of C, which is the question, is going to be 9 times 10. My proportion times my x, there will be 90 c's out of the total of 210. There will be 70 b's and 50 a's. That one's easy because our intermediate variable was the same number in the proportions. What if it wasn't given to me that easily? What if the double ratios given to me would be a to b is 3 to 5, b to c is 2 to 3. In this case, the b's do not match, so I can't quickly align them on a three-way ratio. So what do I do in this case? Well, one quick way is to put the Bs over here and essentially try to set it up like a system of equations almost with the Bs matching in the columns. B to C is 2 to 3. Now my objective is to make this B number the same. How am I going to do that? I'm going to scale each by the other factor. So I get the same value for B. So for the top one, I'm going to scale it by two, which is the other factor. That gives me six to two times five is 10 for A to B. And the next one, I'm going to scale by the five up top, the other factor, which will be two times five is 10, 5 times 3 is 15. Now you can see I've essentially set up a three-way ratio, just like we had in the other problem. It's 6 to 10 to 15, and I can work it just like the other problem. So if up until now, we've dealt with single proportions, double proportions, different presentations, but the ratios themselves, the proportions have been held constant. That may not be the case in several problems. What happens if we then change the amounts of one or more of the elements or things that we're looking at? That's what this lesson is about. Let's start with our double proportion problem where the fixed proportions are given to us in the form of two different ratios and we're provided a total amount of marbles. So we have red to yellow is three to five. How do we do this? We approach it the same way we did before. Set up a proportion equation. And if the total is 160, well, I know that means red plus yellow plus blue equals 160. I'm gonna substitute my two proportion equations in, so everything's presented as a function of R. So R is R plus Y is 5 thirds R given this, B is 8 thirds R. There are 30 red marbles. So now I can actually put amounts, not just proportions, but amounts. 30 red, how many yellow would there be? Well, 5 thirds of 30, which is 50 yellow. And how many blue? They're 8 thirds. Well, given that red is 30, that would be 80 blue. Combine this 80 and 50 and 30, that is our 160 total. So these are the amounts of the different colors of marbles in the bag. 
This is where we left off last. Now we're going to change the number of marbles. How do we handle that in our problem setup? One way to address the change is to set up a table to organize the information you have. We'll use the colors red, yellow, blue, the different things we have as the columns. We know we have 30, 50, 80 of them respectively. To begin with, the rows, we're going to have a beginning amount that we've already calculated, a change which we're going to apply given the problem, and then figure out the correct ending amount to solve the problem. So in this case, suppose we took away 20 yellow marbles. That's a change of minus 20. We didn't change the blue, we didn't change the red. So at the end, I'm going to have 30 red, I'm going to have 30 yellow, and I'm going to have 80 blue. If the problem asks me, what's the new ratio of yellow to blue? I know that answer is now 30 to 80 or 3 to 8. Alternatively, they could give me a final proportion and ask me to figure out how many, say, yellow are at the end. So they could tell me yellow to blue at the end is 1 to 2. So I could say yellow minus some number n to blue is 1 to 2. Okay. Well, I know that's also 50 minus n is to 80 blue at the end. And then I could solve that, essentially set up my proportion equation. 1 to 2, 1 divided by 2, that is, equals 50 minus n over 80, solving for n, n equals 10. So either way, I, I could be flexible about what they're asking and how I solve for it. But no, one way to organize your problem and set it up for the change is to set up a table with the different things, a beginning, a change, and an end. We started with a simple fixed proportion given to us in a problem and an amount of one or all the items. That required us to solve for an missing amount. That was our typical basic proportion problem. We learned how to deal with different presentation formats for that problem. And then we added the complexity of having multiple proportions. The approach was largely the same, always finding missing amounts and solving for those unknowns. Last but not least, we learned how to organize our information to handle changes in the amounts and find any final proportions or final amounts given the final proportions. In short, this same framework can be applied to most proportion problems on the exam. So I hope this helped. And don't forget to practice what you learned. Good luck. Welcome to probability. In this section, we're going to go over the basic concepts you'll need for the SAT. I'm going to try and keep it as user friendly as possible because I know many of you shy away from probability and get a little scared on the topic. But it's a really great skill to learn. Let's start with the scenario of flipping a fair coin with heads or tails outcome three times. We're going to use this to better understand our probability roles. So in this scenario, I'm interested in the number of heads I get on the three flips. And in the table, we can see that's either zero, one, two, or three heads. And the number of possible outcomes, what we call our sample space, is shown organized by those numbers of heads. There are eight possible outcomes from flipping a coin three times as shown above. So with that, let's jump in. The probability of event A equals the number of successful event outcomes as we define it, divided by the number of total possible outcomes independent of event de definition. In many cases, that's our sample space. So let's ask a particular question. What's the probability of getting one head on three flips of a coin. Well, how many ways can I get one head? We see there are three different ways I can possibly get one head. So the number of successes will be three. Divided by our total number of outcomes. Well, there are eight outcomes in all from flipping a coin three times that are possible. 
So that's 3 divided by 8, or 37.5%. That's the probability of exactly one head. All right, what if we wanted the probability of all heads? Well, that's less likely. There's only one scenario where we get all heads. So my number of successes would be 1 divided by the total number, which again is 8 possible outcomes from flipping a coin 3 times. All right, I got that. Rule number two, probabilities of events range between zero and one. So what does that mean? Well, zero is impossible. That's not unlikely, it's impossible. It cannot happen. One is absolutely certain. Not I really think, believe it's gonna happen. It's likely, no, it's certain. And in between is all our range of probabilities on a percentage or fractional basis. Number three, probability of S. S here represents our sample space. That is all the possible outcomes of which there are eight in our scenario of three coin flips above. If I add up all those possible outcomes, if we organize them by the number of heads, say the probability of getting a zero, a one, a two, or three different heads on three flips, well, the sum of all those outcomes must be one. It must be certain. Why? Because there's no other possibility. I can't get negative one heads. I can't get four heads on three flips of a coin. There's no other possible outcomes than zero, one, two, or three heads. So if I add those probabilities all up, it must equal one, which, as we said before, is a certain outcome. I'm certain to get one of these events is what we're essentially saying. Given the last rule, number four tells us the probability of not getting a particular outcome A for an event. So, for example, suppose we want the probability of not getting one head on three flips of a coin. That's going to equal one, our total of all the probabilities, minus the probability of that particular event, which is one head. We saw the probability of one head was three eighths. So the probability of not getting one head is going to be one minus three eighths, which equals five eighths. That's what we call the complement. Where do we see that? We see that in problems a lot when they say at least one in the language. So for example, what's the probability of getting at least one head? Well, at least one head would be one head, two heads or three heads. The only condition that would not meet that is zero heads. So at least one essentially is easier to calculate rather than calculating one, two, and three and adding them up. One minus the probability of zero heads. Well, the probability of zero heads, there's only one occurrence out of eight, so that's going to be one eighth. This would be one minus one eighth or seven eighths. We use the complement space in those cases to answer the questions more quickly. It's important you understand the and and or conditions in probability. We'll start with number five, the and conditions. We'll assume events are independent. The probability of A and B, two events occurring together, equals, well, mathematically, the product of the probabilities. So let's see that in a couple new examples up above. If I have five green marbles and three blue marbles, that's eight marbles in all. So the probability of green, for example, is five, but what's the probability of getting two greens in a row? Would be what? The probability of choosing your first marble is five eighths, and then it depends on with replacement or without replacement. So I'm gonna take note here, because it could be important depending on the problem. It's a concept you need to be aware of. If it's with a replacement, in other words, after I choose my green marble, I put it in the bag again, I have eight marbles to choose from, then I'm multiplying by the next pick could also be five eighths. My answer would be 25 64 But what if it's without replacement? then I only have, after my first pick, four green marbles left. I still have three blue marbles. That means my probability of choosing green on my next pick is going to be four successes, four green marbles to choose, out of seven. My probability of two greens in a row would be 20 56th or 5 14th, simplifying it. 
So again, for an and condition, remember you're filtering your set. You're reducing the number that meet the multiple conditions. You're reducing your probability. So notice one marble, it's a 5 eighths or 62.5% chance of success. But to get two green marbles in a row, it's 5 fourteenths or a little better than a third chance of success. Let's look at the deck of cards. What's the chance of getting a king of hearts from one selection out of the deck of cards? Well, really, this is the probability of getting a king and a heart together, if we think of it. Well, okay. So what's the probability of getting a king? The probability of a king is four. There are four kings in a deck out of 52. And the probability of getting a heart, well, that's one of four suits. So there are actually 13 hearts in a deck out of 52. And these numbers reduce to essentially 1 13th times 1 4th or 1 52nd. The probability of selecting a king of hearts using my and condition, multiplying the probabilities of each event is 1 52nd. Well, that makes sense. There's only one king of hearts in a deck of cards. So my successful count is one out of 52 cards. Let's go back to the marble scenario to look at a particular variation you should be aware of. If I want the probability of getting a blue and a green on two choices of a marble, how would I do that? Well, that suggests it would be the probability of blue times the probability of green, which in this case, the probability of blue is 3 eighths. Again, we have to be careful about whether it's with or without replacement. If we're replacing marbles, my probability of green will be 5 eighths. If it's without replacement, I'll still have five green marbles to choose from, but my total marble count will go down to seven. We're gonna assume the without replacement scenario here. So that would suggest 15 56 is the probability of getting a blue and a green. Except for one problem. We've assumed here blue first. In other words, we're assuming we get blue, then green. But the reality is I could get green and then blue as well. That's equally as likely. So what I need to do in this case is actually add the likelihood of the other scenario, which is also 1556. And the probability of getting a blue or a green is really the sum of these or 30 56. It's a little more than a half rather than a little more than a quarter. When I was adding probabilities a second ago, that was really my OR condition at work. The OR condition essentially means add probability. So the probability of A or B is the probability of A plus B. Notice this is a union of sets. It's adding to the count or the probability. So for example, before we saw the probability of two greens was 20 56 and the probability of a blue and a green in either order was 30 over 56. If I wanted the probability of either two greens or a blue and a green, the correct answer would be the sum of those two probabilities. So that would be 20 56 plus 30 56. The answer would be 50 56. Okay, let's see that in another example. How about we roll a single six-sided die? What's the probability of getting a two come up on the die? Well, it's gonna be one. There's one two out of six sides. What's the probability of getting a four on a roll of a six-sided die? Again, that's one six. There's one four on the die for a six-sided die. What's the probability of getting a two or a four come up on the roll of one dice? That's gonna be the sum of the probabilities. One six plus one six equals two six or one third. I have a one third chance of getting a two or a four from the roll of one die. This assumes the outcomes are mutually exclusive. What does that mean exactly for that fancy word? It essentially says I cannot get a two and a four at the same time. I either roll a two or I roll a four. 
I can't roll a 2-4. That would be like having a cat dog. It just doesn't exist. Let's look at the 52-card deck scenario. What's the probability in this case of getting a king or a heart? This scenario is not mutually exclusive. So it's going to work slightly different. I am not simply going to add probabilities. I've got to subtract the end condition, the probability of A and B where they intersect based on how we calculated the end condition in the last section. So what does this look like? The probability of a king or a heart. Well, my probability of getting a king I know is 4 50 seconds from before. And I'm going to add to that, like my basic or condition when it's mutually exclusive, the probability of a heart, which you said was 13, 50 seconds. Okay, that would be great, except this is not mutually exclusive. I can get a king of hearts. There is an overlapping and condition that is true. In this case, I have to subtract the count of a king and a heart, which is the one king of hearts. And that's a probability of 152. My answer is going to be 4 plus 13, 17 minus 1, 16 over 52, or reduced to 4 thirteenths. The probability of selecting a king or a heart is 4 thirteenths. And this scenario is not mutually exclusive. And no discussion of probability would be complete without a review of conditional probability, which frequently comes up on the exam. Essentially, conditional probability, indicated by this notation, is the probability of A given B. That's what the slash means. It's not a divide symbol. It's A given B. Well, what does that mean? It means it's the probability of A and B, which we learned how to calculate already, that's the product of the two probabilities, divided by the probability of B, that event that's given to you. I think this is easier to understand by example. Let's look at our deck of cards. What would the probability of a king be given that you have hearts. What would that look like? Well, that would be the probability of my king and my hearts, which we already learned to calculate. That's essentially four kings out of a deck of 52 cards times 13 hearts out of a deck of 52 cards, which turned out to be essentially one 50 second. In this case, we're dividing it by the probability of hearts, the probability of event B, our given condition, our restriction. Okay, so what's that in this case? The probability of hearts, as we said, is 13 out of 52, or one fourth. So what does that calculation work out to? The probability of getting a king, given we have hearts, is 1 13th according to this calculation. And that makes sense conceptually. If we think about it, my universe of cards to choose from is only hearts. There are 13 of them. There's not 52 of the whole deck. I've conditioned it to look only at hearts. And out of that 13, there's only one that's the king of hearts. So my probability would be 1 13th. If we rearrange this statement here, we will get the probability of A and B in general is the probability of B times the probability of A given B. Remember before we said the probability of A and B is the product of probability A times probability of B, but we were under the restriction of independent events. If we're not under that restriction and it's not necessarily independent, more generally the calculation is the probability of B times the probability of A given B. So let's look at an example out of tables where you're most likely to see this in action on the exam and how it works. In the following example, there's either male or female that have blue or brown eyes. So we've got data filling out our table. Let's take a look at the first question. Suppose I wanted to know what's the probability of male and blue, that you're a blue-eyed boy or a blue-eyed male. Well, that would be the intersection of blue and male. That would be 25, that square there. Over what total? 
This is a non-conditional probability problem, so it would be over the 100, the complete universe of people in the study. So it's 25 over 100, or 1 quarter would be the answer for that. Let's look at another non-conditional probability problem. What's the probability I'm female or brown-eyed? So in this case, we're looking for examples that meet one condition only. Remember, or, only one side has to be true. So this block 10 is female, so that must meet female or brown. This block is 30 is brown and female, so it meets the condition of one or the other. And this block meets the condition of brown. Not female, but brown, therefore the one condition makes the or true. How about the 25? That's blue and male, so I don't have either a female or brown in there. That's not included. So the answer here would be the sum of 10 and 30 and 35, 75 over 100 would be the probability of female or brown. Again, notice the total 100 is my denominator. All right, let's try another one. What's the probability of male or brown, but not both? In this case, if I look through the different options, male, blue eye, 25. Well, that is male, so that meets our one side of the or condition. The 10 is female, blue eyed. That doesn't meet either of our conditions, so that doesn't work for this one. How about the 30, female with brown eyes? Well, that's male or brown, that's brown. So that part makes our or condition true. And then if I go up to the 35, that's brown and male. Uh-oh, we had but not both. This one is both, so I need to eliminate that from my condition. So my total here will be 25 plus 30, 55 divided by 100. That would be the probability of male or brown-eyed, but not both. Now let's look at conditional probability problems. So remember, you have to read carefully on these problems to decide whether it's conditional or not conditional in the problem. What if, for example, I want the probability of having blue eyes given that I'm male? So the wording of the problem might actually say, what's the probability of males having blue eyes? In this case, the probability of being male and blue or the count of being male and blue is 25. I'm going to divide that not by my full 100 people. I am only care that the condition is males. So my denominator is going to be the more restrictive number of total males, which is 60. My denominator becomes a smaller, more restricted set. The probability of having blue eyes given your male is 25 sixtieths. What's the probability of a brown-eyed person being female? Okay, in other words, if you're given that you're brown eyes, what's the probability of female? So given that you have brown eyes means you fall into this group here, a total of 65 brown-eyed people. That will be our denominator. So what's the probability that you're female given you have brown eyes? Well, we can see 30 females have brown eyes. So the correct answer for this conditional probability problem, what's the probability that a brown-eyed person ha is female, would be 30 65ths. Since probability depends on counts, let's spend a little time learning about some counting theories and concepts. Not too much, the exam won't get directly into what we call combinatorics, but let's learn some of the basics real quick. We're going to begin with the counting principle. If events are independent events, the number of ways I would count event A and B and C, multiple accounts all occurring together, it's simply going to be the product of each of the individual accounts. That's kind of like our probability rules. If I have probability of A and B, it's probability of A times probability of B. Here are multiplying counts. So let's look at an example. Suppose I wanted to line five children up in order for recess. How many ways could I do that? Well, the way I would think of that is each selection of a child would be an individual event. So there would be five events here, five selections to line the students up for recess. Okay, well, the first person that I would select, I can choose from five people. 
How about the second person I would select? Well, again, in this scenario, it's without replacement, which is an important concept, again, as we saw earlier, with and without replacement. I can't replace the one student I picked for first in line, so I only have four students left to choose from. I multiply by four. My third pick, I'll have three students left, and I'm going to multiply by that count. The fourth pick will be two students to choose from, and multiply finally by that last student, okay? This is what we would call five factorial. If you're not familiar with the factorial notation, five exclamation mark means five factorial, which is five times every integer going down to one in the product. Five times four times three times two times one. 10 factorial would be 10 times nine times eight times seven times six times seven, all the way down to one, right? Okay, and we know what that is. This is essentially six times 20 or 120 ways to line five children up in order for recess. Okay, what about, let's try another example. Let's suppose I had the name James. Let's ignore, you know, capitals versus lowercase. How many ways can I arrange the letters? Well, I've got one, two, three, four, five different letters. So my first selection, I would choose from five letters. My second from four letters left, because I can't use a letter once I've chosen it. It's without replacement. And I'll essentially get the same thing. There'll be five factorial ways to arrange the five unlike objects here. So in general, there are n factorial ways to arrange n, and here's the key, unlike objects without replacement. Okay, so what do I mean by unlike objects? Well, each child I lined up for recess was an unlike object. Each letter in the name James is an unlike object for our purposes. Okay, well, let's change this up a little bit. What if I had the name of your favorite female rock band, ABBA? How many ways could I arrange the letters in ABBA? Well, here we've got repeats, right? They're not unlike. That's not true. I have two A's and two B's. Well, we follow the same pattern. If they were unlike objects, there'd be four factorial ways to arrange them. But I now need to divide by the two A's that repeat, which there are two factorial ways to arrange them if they were different, but they're not. That's why I'm dividing by two factorial. And for the repeating B's, the two of them, I need to divide by two factorial there. So the correct way to calculate the number of ways to arrange the letters in ABBA would be four factorial over two factorial, two factorial for the repeating two A's and two B's. That works out too. Factorial math is a little different. Lay it all out. Two times ones cancel. Four times three divided by two is six ways. And we could actually see the six ways. That's easy enough to show and count visually. It's ABBA, it's also AA, BB, BA. That's it. We can see the actual number of ways the letters in ABBA can be arranged. It's a nice check to our math. Okay, so you think you have that down. How many ways can I arrange the letters in the word Mississippi? M I S S I S S I P P I. Well, there are 11 letters. So if I started off assuming they're different, it would be 11 factorial ways to arrange it. But they're not all different. I have four S's repeating, so I need to divide by four factorial. I have four I's repeating, so I need to divide by four factorial for the I's. And last but not least, I've got two P's repeating. I need to divide by two factorial for the P's. That is your answer. Good luck calculating it. Have fun. What if instead I'm not choosing all n out of n objects, but some subset r out of n objects? So essentially, r objects are chosen, and n minus r, the remainder, are not chosen. How do I calculate that? Well, I can think of n minus r not chosen as repeats. They're all the same. So, for example, if I wanted to choose two out of five students to line up for recess, that would be, we'd refer to that as permutation five choose two, which would be essentially our five factorial to arrange five students, but I would divide by the repeating n minus r that are not chosen. 
So that would be 5 minus 2 or 3 factorial. Effectively, there are 5 times 4, 3, 2, 1 over 3, 2, 1 equals 20 ways to arrange two students out of five in order online. Notice the concept of order matters here for permutations. In general, this is essentially n factorial divided by n minus r factorial is permutation n choose r. Okay, well, let's try a combination. What's the difference with that one? Well, suppose we have objects where order does not matter. Let's say I have five green marbles. How many ways can I choose two of them where whether I choose the first or the third green marble doesn't really matter, right? There's no order concept there. So that we would call combination five choose two. And in this case, again, there are five ways or five factorial ways to choose among five different objects. And the not chosen ones, well, they're essentially repeats. So I'll divide by the three, the five minus two factorial or three factorial. So far, it's just like a permutation. Now, the only difference is the two I chose are also essentially the same. They're both green. Order doesn't matter. So I need to not count for that ordering. I need to divide by the two same chosen marbles in this case. The answer is 5 factorial over 3 factorial over 2 factorial. So it's the same answer as before, 20 up above, but now divided by 2 factorial, which is really dividing by 2. There are 10 ways to choose 2 green marbles out of 5 green ma marbles. Here, the concept of order does not matter. That's the key difference between a combination and a permutation. In general, we would write this as combination n, choose r, some subset of r elements, that equals n factorial over n minus r factorial, exactly the same thing as a permutation, but now the difference is I divide by that extra factorial, the number of elements I'm choosing. I'm choosing. So examples of that might be selecting toppings on a pizza. If I had five toppings to choose on a pizza and I needed to choose two, I would use a combination because mushrooms and pepperoni is no different than if I ordered pepperoni then mushrooms. The same pizza would come out. The concept of order of selected items doesn't matter in that case. So I'd use combination five choose two and my answer would be 10 ways I could choose two toppings out of five for my pizza. Before, we used the example of five green and three red marbles. And we calculated the probability of a green and a red, or actually I think we used blue. But we ultimately came up with this answer of 1528 in our special scenario where we had to worry about the number of arrangements. We could have also done this by a combinations counting. I could have counted my numerator. The number of ways I can get one green marble is combination five choose one times the number of ways I can choose one red marble was combination three. I'm choosing one red marble, the product of those two. Divided by the total count of all outcomes would be combination out of eight marbles in all, how many ways can I choose two? Well, what does this work out to? Combination five choose one is five factorial over four factorial, which is five. And combination three choose one is three factorial over two factorial, which is three. And combination eight choose two is eight times seven. The six, five, four, three, two, ones cancel, but I have to divide by my R factorial, since order doesn't matter, which is two. In the end, this gives us the same answer, 15 over 28. And that, in a nutshell, is a very quick summary of counting and combinations and permutations, which may help on the exam. Suppose you had the following question. How many more ways can I choose two green marbles than two red marbles? How would I do that? Well, I would have to figure out 
the number of ways I can choose two green marbles. That would be combination five, choose two, which is five factorial over three factorial, two factorial, which in turn is really five times four divided by two times one, which is 10. How many ways can I choose two red marbles? That's combination three, choose two, which is three factorial over one factorial, two factorial, which in turn is really three times two times one over two times one, it's three. So how many more ways can I choose two green marbles than two red marbles? The answer is 10 minus three, seven.